In this segment, we're going to talk about the GPT series of models and uh, start to look at how models got so big and so powerful and how that led to the capabilities that we have today. So all of these models are structurally simple and kind of go back to the sorts of transformer language models that we developed earlier in the course. So they're all just left to right language models that are trained on raw text that are auto regressively predicting the next word. So there's none of the kind of sequence to sequence capabilities of uh, some of the other things we're talking about. Uh, we're going to skip GPT-1. Uh, this came out before BERT and uh, isn't really all that important to understand from today's perspective. Uh, GPT-2 was uh, the, one of the first of these to make a really big splash and advance the state of the art. It was trained on around 40 gigabytes of text. And it was a lot larger than the other models that existed at the time. So for example, BERT was around 300 million parameters and GPT-2 was around five times that size. And this was at a time when folks were still kind of reeling from how big BERT was and how expensive it was to use. Uh, so when in, March, in the context of March 2019, when this was released, it was really a kind of head and shoulders ahead of the rest of the models. And one of the things that it did that we hadn't really seen happen before was its ability to generate a sequence of coherent sentences. So remember that BERT can't actually generate text so people had been using BERT and achieving really strong results on all these classification problems, but GPT-2 was the first one that sort of kind of hinted at the future capabilities of things like ChatGPT to like spit out an entire response that uh, kind of makes sense. So subsequently, about a year later, uh, GPT-3 was released, and this was a much, much larger model, 175 billion parameters. Uh, so the number of heads and layers had gone up dramatically, and the dimensionality of the vectors in the transformer was also up to about 12,000. So you can see this comparison here to a lot of the other things that existed at the time in terms of the amount of compute used. And compared to T5, which was a major effort from Google, this was about another order of magnitude higher. So really, really big, really, really expensive to train. Probably the main thing that this started to sort of revolutionize was the ability to do something called in-context learning, which we're going to be talking about a lot. So previous models had been fine-tuned. We've talked about how with BERT, you take it, you have your classification data set, you backpropagate into it for a few epochs, and you get it to do uh, whatever you want it to do. Similarly, uh, for these other models, you can uh, fine-tune them and get them to generate text in the format that you want or answer particular questions. In this case, we don't do any kind, we don't make any gradient updates to the model at all. We're just going to run it off the shelf. And the idea here is that if we give the model a kind of pattern in its context, it should be able to continue that pattern. And what we're showing here is an example of translation, where we say, translate English to French, sea otter goes to l'outre de mer, peppermint goes to menthe poivre, uh, et cetera, and then cheese goes to blank. Now, this is entirely just a string that is being given to the language model. There's no kind of structure here at all. I mean, there is a kind of implicit structure in it, but uh, it's entirely formatted as a string and the model conditions on it. So the reason why this should sort of work is, well, if we're modeling kind of the probability of the next token, given all the tokens that came before, I mean, as humans, we can look at this and say, all right, well, if someone is giving us a list of English word translation in French, English word translation in French, then presumably the most common thing or the, the, the highest probability thing to come next would also be the translation of this last word. However, the model is not learning through any kind of backpropagation into its parameters. This concept is entirely communicated through this language model context. And so the model needs to kind of associate these 
things together and say, okay, well, I'm seeing a bunch of these examples and over here I see, oh, okay, this stuff's all in French. And by the way, it has to have seen French data before. Otherwise, this is just totally not gonna work. If it's never seen the word fromage, there's kind of information theoretically, it's like gonna be super hard to come up with the answer. Um, but through all the layers of the transformer, it can kind of associate these different examples together and then ideally actually produce uh, the right answer, which in this case is fromage. So the kind of capability here, it, it, it seems almost obvious in some sense that, well, okay, well, just, just ask the model what the answer is. Uh, but it was very non-obvious that this would work. And they have a graph in the GPT-3 paper, which really kind of shows how surprising this is. So we have on the x-axis here the number of examples that are given to the model in the context, so like the number of translations. And uh, we see all the way on the left is zero, so that's not giving any uh, examples, that's just asking the model to do the task. Um, now this works quite well with ChatGPT, but you can look at with GPT-3, this was actually still at like 10% accuracy with this natural language prompt line. Now, if we go up to one or 10 examples, the 10 to the zero or 10 to the one, we see that this 175 billion parameter model really takes off. It starts to get 50, 60% accuracy on the tasks they're looking at here. But this 1.3 billion parameter model is still like kind of down in the dumps on the bottom of the slide here. It's not working at all. And remember that even a year before, this was already a model that was like shockingly large. And how are you gonna train and manage models that are this big? So this was really something that started to emerge and only made sense once the models got to a certain size. And that was necessary before these ideas could even be explored in any meaningful way. So in terms of how well it did, the GPT-3 paper evaluates on a bunch of standard benchmark tasks. And if you look at the top line here, fine-tuned state of the art, actually the model is not kind of blowing us out of the water on any of these tasks, right? Uh, on the super glue data set, which is this meta benchmark consisting of a bunch of other tasks, uh, it's actually around 20% worse than what was possible with existing methods. However, it was the GPT-3 model was using only this few shot in context learning. So it was only exposed to a small number of examples of each task. So if you're a kind of glass half full person, it's like, wow, it's great that it can do well at all, do, do kind of decently at all of these tasks uh, without having been trained on them with gradient updates. On the other hand, you know, it still hadn't kind of completely exceeded the state of the art in all of these different areas. Uh, so you could kind of look at the different data sets and sometimes it's like pretty impressive and pretty close and sometimes it's farther away. Um, and in general, you know, the results were kind of mixed, still strong for this few shot setting, but this also wasn't really playing to the strengths of the model because these weren't the sort of uh, language generation oriented things where large language models have really taken off. So this was this kind of start of this fundamental paradigm shift. There's a lot of other models that are now in the same class basically as GPT-3. Uh, Llama, Palm, OPT, Bloom, Pythia. There will probably be many, many more by the time you're watching this video. And, uh, you know, these all have decent capabilities here. The most modern set of things like ChatGPT, GPT-4 have an additional ingredient, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, reinforcement learning from human feedback or instruction tuning, basically additional ways of infusing supervised data to get them to be even better at these sort of capabilities than just training on language modeling gives you. That's the end of the segment.